So hi, uh, I'm Lizzie, and I'm a journalist uh, and a writer, and I have uh, two books out. Um, one is about LARP, where I went and I did immersion reporting, uh, gonzo journalism, um, about the world of live action role play, or LARP, which is um, a style of live game where you embody a character, you like dress up as a character, go into the woods, and you interact with other people who are also characters. Uh, and I'm also a game designer. I have designed uh, two games. Um, one is about hereditary breast cancer, which is also the topic of my next book out this fall. And um, I've also designed a game about uh, love, boredom, and inspiration at an artist colony. Uh, so I'm Emily Boss, and uh, I'm also a game designer uh, forester during the day and, um, and a game theorist. I like to talk about games and how they work. Um, and I also, uh, I published my own games. I'm an independent publisher, um, made possible by the internet. Yes, exactly, it's so wonderful. Um, and by communities of creativity, which uh, really help in this endeavor. And we're gonna talk to you about uh, sex and love in games. So it's appropriate that it's a little hot in here. <laughs> So, uh, we mostly don't play romance in games, um, and so why should we? Uh, represents the real world that we live in, right? People fall in love all the time. Um, widens the number of playable plot lines when you're not focusing on violence, when you have love also as a plot line. Uh, everybody wins, right? More stories, everybody wins. Um, playing love or sex can provide an intense experience because uh, love is as intense as violence is. Um, and there's like an, an unbelievable number of games out there in the world that ask us to play murder hobos who wander around killing people and taking their stuff to become more awesome. <laughs> And that's kind of messed up if we think about games as reinforcing behavior in the world. We want fewer murder hobos, more people falling in love and getting it on. So <laughs> there's this wonderful Swedish LARPright uh, named Emma Wieslander. And she created a sex mechanic we'll talk about later called Arzamandi. But what she said was that creating situations or even whole societies where only feelings of hate, anger, and aggression are expected to surface scares me. Yeah. Also, that it's so normalized tells you something about the vast need of promoting all the other aspects. Love, romance, and sex are some of them. I also believe that these stories deserve to be told in their own right and not just as background info motivating the violence. So let's take this laudable goal of putting love and sex into games and think about it from a game design perspective. Uh, so I offer a little bit of a rubric, three questions that you can ask yourself if you're working on designing a game or if you're interested in thinking about games, you can use this to analyze them. Uh, and this, we're, we're talking about role-playing games, tabletop or live, but we've been talking about video games the whole night, so really it generalizes fairly well. So first, in thinking about introducing romance or love or sex into a game, you really have to think about what role will romance play? Um, what is it going to add to the game that the game wouldn't have otherwise? Uh, this would be good also to do with violence. I think often people introduce violence reflexively because you expect to have that in a game. But then you can think, what, what is it adding? What is it creating? Um, then uh, if you find that you d would like to have romance in the game, um, you want to think about what, what, uh, what percentage of the game is going to have it. Is it going to be central to the story? Is it going to be a motivating factor for your characters? Uh, or is it just something that maybe is giving you some more depth of uh, understanding of the story or the characters in it? Then, if, having had made this decision to have it in, the love in the game, how do you make sure that your players are going to feel comfortable doing that? It can be very uh, tense or intense to do that. So designing a game that's going to create the proper uh, atmosphere is really important. Um, and how do you create shared expectations, uh, which allows everyone to know what, what is going to happen and how it's going to uh, go. Um, and also really being able to create trust among the players so that they can know that they're with other people who they can be honest or um, engage fully. Uh, so when you really get down to it, the main question you're going to ask is uh, what experience do you want to give the players? Um, 
And when you're thinking about love and romance, a really important question to answer is how, exactly how explicit is this game going to be? Um, Liz is going to talk about a particular mechanic that really helps you go to the hot side, um, but you can do this in many different ways. What if I want my sex to be unsexy, Emily? Uh, if you want your sex to be unsexy, then uh, you might you represent it with card play. You know, you can have it be an element of the story, but not necessarily something that's going to titillate. But on the other side, you can also create something that's very erotic. So, um, you have to tell your players how they're going to play love or romance. Uh, not everybody is comfortable playing love or romance, and I've seen game designers think that uh, if they just write it into the characters, it's like totally going to happen. Um, and like, no, it's, it's not going to happen unless you tell people how to play it. Uh, because mechanics set up a player's expectation of what is going to happen in the game. Um, if you give your players a bunch of lock picks, they're going to be really mad if there are no locks to pick in your game. Um, and by the same token, if you give players a way to play romance or sex, they're going to expect to fall in love and get it on. Um, so you can facilitate play about romance by giving players the tools. So if we're talking about making a romance or sex mechanic, uh, it's important to consider a few things when it comes to how you do that. The main one is consent. Um, consent is the cornerstone of a good experience just in general. Um, and so you want giving and retracting it to be part of the game on the player level at least. I think it's okay to discuss anything in a game so long as you're doing it thoughtfully. Uh, and so, so anyway, but at, at least at the player level, you want to make sure people have the ability to opt in and opt out. You don't want someone to come out of your game feeling that um, they had a scene that they really didn't want to have on a player level. There are also mechanical concerns. How you set up the mechanics says something about uh, how you think sex is in the world. So what kind of sex does your mechanic enable? What kind of romance does your mechanic enable? And is that how you want it to be? Um, if, you pres if you give players a sex mechanic where one partner is always active and one partner is passive, this can mean that uh, the gender roles in the game are mirroring sort of the stereotype of what we think of heterosexual sex in real life. And, you know, it's okay to write a game about that, so long as you know that you're writing a game about that, so long as you understand what the limitations of the mechanic are. You also want to think about aftercare. Um, can be intense to play love, and so you want to help participants process their own experiences. Uh, especially in live games. I don't know very much about video games, but uh, let me tell you, people who play love plot lanes in LARPs sometimes uh, need a little debrief time at the end just to sort of set on the shelf that like Emily and I were in love for four hours, but like she's married and I'm married and to different people, uh, <laughs> right? <laughs> Um, and you also want to consider what the heat level is. Uh, sex is really great, and it's totally okay to be turned on by a game. Um, it's also okay to make a sex mechanic that's deliberately unsexy, but you want to kind of have control of that. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about one particular sex mechanic, or a mechanic for intimacy, and that's Ars Amandi. Um, Ars Amandi is used in LARPs, which, as I, I said briefly in my introduction, are live games where you're playing a role and you're standing up, and it looks kind of like improv theater, but there's no audience, and it's got, uh, in fact, uh, what Finnish uh, LARP academic Marcus Montola calls the first-person audience. Um, so you're performing for yourself and for others. It was created by Swedish LARP writer Emma Wieslander from Mela Himmela Hav, which was a LARP based on the writings of Ursula Le Guin, aimed at undermining um, uh, gender and uh, monogamy. So in this game, uh, there were the, gen the playable genders were morning people and evening people, and uh, marriage was between two morning people and two evening people. And um, all four of them together. All four of them together. Uh, and it was a, the occasion for play of the game, I believe, was like a wedding where some children were getting married. Um, Arzamandi, as a mechanic, uses arm touching to simulate intimacy. Uh, so you're allowed to touch permitted zones with permitted body parts. And the permitted body parts for touch are your hands and your forearms. And the permitted zones for touch are your arms up to your shoulders. 
Uh, and, and in full Arzamandi, which is rarely done, you can also touch people with your neck, and you can also touch people like above the boobs and below the ears, uh, like above the sternum and below the ears. Um, and there are all of these, well, just going back for a second, one of the great things about this technique is that it's very um, adaptable. So uh, it doesn't, you know, it's not that like when I shake hands, when I touch Emily's hand, it's not like this signifies a particular sex act. Um, but the attitude with which I touch her, if I'm a little playful, you know, that, that means uh, it, it can be a little playful, it can be very serious, it can be firm, it can be gentle. You know, you can add in eye, eye contact if you want, which a lot of people say ups the intimacy. You can add in noises, bre rough breathing if you want, which also ups the intimacy. So it's very, it's very and it's a, it's a kind of gender neutral boundary. Uh, on most people. Um, consent. So when you use this technique, usually you use uh, transparency and safe words. The practice of transparency is basically you just tell people what's going to happen in the game. If I say to all of you that I'm holding a game with Arzamandi um, next weekend and you're invited uh, and it's going to, romance is going to be kind of the main point of the game and like you will be using this technique probably or I'm designing the game for you to use this technique then you can decide whether or not you're up for it. You know, I don't give you uh, two hours of game. I, I don't tell you that this is a game about zombies and then like bring out the Arzamandi in act three, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, and also it's usually used in conjunction with safe words. Safe words are words that you can say to modulate the intensity of play. So if you say cut or in Arzamandi, often we use the double tap, you can tap out of a scene that is making you uncomfortable. Um, and that's a way to withdraw the consent that you've given um, by becoming, by joining the game. Uh, mechanical roles, uh, as I mentioned, Arzamandi can represent many different sorts of sex. It doesn't map directly onto physiology uh, in a very strong way. And it can represent not just sex, but emotional closeness between people. Um, and aftercare, usually there is a debrief after games of this type where you sit around in a circle with the other participants and you talk to them about anything that did go wrong or might have go wrong, gone wrong. You talk to them about their feelings and you uh, take a minute to return from the world of the game into the world of reality. And it is totally hot. I, I've run some workshops in the US and many people uh, have told me afterward that they are taking it home to their partners. <laughs> All right. So I wanted to talk a little bit about the process of designing a particular game, a full game, that uses romance uh, in it. And I actually, I haven't just written, written one, but three games that are a trilogy of games that have romance as a theme. And I came to it a little bit accidentally, um, started by, as, as many great things are these days, an argument on the internet. <laughs> There was someone who was saying, I've never seen and I don't believe that it's possible for a person to play a character of a different gender than themselves. And I thought, wow, so it's OK and easy to play orcs and elves, which don't even exist, but not someone who's different from you that you see every day. Um, so I thought the best way to answer this wasn't really to argue on the internet, because that's just endless, but to write a game that disproves it. So uh, I had the idea for Breaking the Ice, which was the first game that I published. I published it in 2005. Um, and I thought, OK, what's a, what's a good situation to be able to ask people to do this and it not be obvious that that's what I'm doing? So uh, the situation in the game is you're playing two characters who go, who go on their first three dates, and you see whether they fall in love. Very simple. Um, and uh, breaking the ice. You actually have the players break the ice by talking a little bit about themselves and you figure out some way that they differ. If it's obvious, if, if the two people who are playing are different gender, you can swap roles. Uh, or um, this has been great actually because I run this at a lot of conventions which we've talked a lot tonight about how white and male they are. Um, so I'd run this for uh, two white guys and they'd have to talk and they'd say, okay, so all right, we're guys, we're white, uh, what do you do for a living? Oh, you work in computers. Okay, me too. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> 
So they'd actually have to dig down a little deeper to figure out how do they differ, and then create characters that have that element to them. And you're not playing yourselves, it's just, it's a character that allows you to play and step out. So um, to do this, I, I ended up taking on a lot of restrictions that games don't usually have. It was only for two players. Uh, I made it a collaborative game where you're helping one another. Um, and each person is, is uh, on uh, the same terms. They're, everybody's trying something new, uh, so you're both off a little bit, and you're intentionally helping one another. But as I was writing this, I realized, OK, this is going to limit my audience a little bit. What if there's five people that want to play, and there's only a two-player game? So that's how I got the idea to write three games. Uh, the second game is a love triangle. And the third game, I, I thought, OK, so uh, I need a situation that's going to involve love that has lots of people in it. Uh, oh, well, we could have this situation, which I had seen in my own life, um, where you have a circle of friends. And some people are in partnerships, some are not. And all of a sudden, I don't know why, people start falling in love with people they are not involved with. <laughs> And it just kind of runs like fire sometimes. And I don't know if this happens to everybody. Maybe it's me. Um, but really, it was, it was mostly during my 20s. So I might blame a generational thing there. <laughs> um, or at least that, that phase of one's life where you're exploring romance and love and what relationships and fidelity and, and commitment means. Um, so I thought that this would be a good setting for a game. Uh, so that's a huge task. I thought about this game for years before I actually wrote it. And it didn't uh, come together until I had played some games in the Nordic tradition, uh, which were freeform, which weren't quite LARP, where you run around and talk in character all the time, but are sort of a halfway between that and tabletop. And I realized, oh, this is what I need. I actually need the embodiment of it to play out the roles, to create um, the kind of atmosphere that will really, really help make this game work. So thinking back to my, my three questions, uh, what was the role of romance going to be? Absolutely central. It's the inciting event. Everyone falls in love with different people. The characters are connected through their love and their relationships as well. Um, and in the game, I chose to create a, a very specific moment uh, that uses some techniques um, that are similar to the Nordic uh, techniques, um, which uh, it, Every character that's in a relationship has a, a moment in the, in the story where they have to decide, OK, I'm falling in love with this new person. Am I going to do something with that person that is really outside of the bounds of my, my uh, original relationship? Um, they can say no. They can say yes. Um, but to give it a um, kind of a strength and an um, emphasis, I allowed other people who are playing to play the angel on your shoulder or the devil on your shoulder to talk about why you should or should not do that thing. And a wonderful thing that, that you do is that the person who's playing your character's partner gets to choose first whether they want to be the angel or the devil. <laughs> and it's really interesting the choices that people make. Um, people come out with an incredible amount of insight about what's going on in these characters' minds. Uh, what love means, um, what it would mean to break out of a relationship, or, or what is uh, holding people back from, from being the most they can be, uh, as sometimes relationships end up holding us um, back when we don't realize it. So. Um, so OK, that's a lot to ask of players. Particularly, I, I've played this with people who are absolute strangers. They've never met one another. Uh, they come to a convention, and they play this game. So how do I, how do, I do that? How do I ask them? Um, and transparency actually has been very, very important. Uh, um, Lizzie made a comment before about being able to disassociate the strong in-character experiences you have. So I have as part of the rules that at the beginning of the game, everyone just introduces themselves to the other people. So you have a moment where you're saying, OK, this is another person I'm interacting with. And then uh, I ask people to just disclose what their real life relationship status is. You don't have to be in detailed. You can tell a little bit more if you want. Uh, sometimes people talk about their sexual orientation. Um, and it just allows everybody to check in for a moment about who they are, and then to remember that whatever this fictional experience that you have, you can, you can commit deeply, because the other people know that it's going to uh, come back around to our real world. Um, and let's see, the game is very collaborative. So again, there's that give and take, which creates trust among the participants. And everyone helps each other create the characters so you know each other very well. And you also use safe words. You use cut and break in this game. Um, and you allow time, if you can at all, possibly, to debrief afterwards. 
And I've had many players say that they played the game for four hours and then they spend the next eight hours talking about what happened in the game. So people often find that space and uh, it really creates bonding too between people to have this. Um, and I think that the game has delivered on what my hopes were, which were to give people a very deep experience. Um, and one of, the, one of the elements that I introduced to do that was that when you create the characters, you actually choose a core issue. Maybe it's loneliness or anger. And it's something that you can explore uh, that the character is shaped around. Um, and we invite the players in a, a tradition that's called playing close to home in uh, Nordic freeform, which you, if you want, you don't have to, you can choose something that has real resonance for you as a person. Um, maybe there's someone in your family who struggles with that issue. Maybe it's something that's difficult for you. You can take a moment to imagine different ways that that could play out or to inhabit it. Um, and also, it was very important to me, um, uh, having had these experiences, to create a space to play with and talk about and imagine polyamorous relationships. Um, and it's also a very, very profound and uh, uh, productive way to talk about monogamous relationships as well. So all that helped to deepen the experience. So these are some other games that also involve love and romance. Um, most of them are, live, are tabletop games. Some of them are live action games. Uh, you can find them at the uh, Role Playing Game Geek, which is a great forum um, that uh, has information about a wide variety of role playing games. Uh, it's wonderful that these slides will, or this video will be online later and this links uh, so you can find them and you don't have to take notes now. But for people watching at home, please uh, feel free to look. There's a lot. Of, there's a tremendous wealth and growth right now of a diversity of types of stories happening in games, whether it's love or romance or whatever else. So I hope you find great things for yourself. Did you have any other last comments, Lizzie? Or? No. All right, I guess we're done. Thank you so much.